Good morning. Uh, my name is Jakub Karas, and I would like to welcome you on today's webinar on the possibilities of image analysis. If you will have uh, any questions during the webinar, please post them in the chat and we will get back after the presentation. And now I turn it over to Dr. Lindsay Marshall, Application Specialist for IVA Image Analysis, and enjoy our webinar. Thank you very much. So as already mentioned, um, today I'm going to give you a brief introduction to AVIA. <coughs> My name is Lindsay Marshall. I am the AVIA Customer Success Manager in the EMEA region. I am relatively new to the AVIA team, so should we have any questions that I cannot address specifically on today's call, um, I will make an effort to um, discover the answers to these questions so that they can be addressed in later sessions. So I do not need to tell you that often image acquisition can be challenging. In order to draw insights out of biological material, we need to prepare the material, visualize it, certain aspects of it, and then analyze to obtain results that hope, hopefully support our hypotheses. As you can see, each step in this workflow has its own challenges, but what is clear is that image acquisition is not the final step. Moreover, a pretty picture in science is no longer enough and analysis of images is crucial. So what is AVIA and how can it help? AVIA is an image visualization and analysis software that uses artificial intelligence, often referred to as AI, to simplify key steps in the image analysis pipeline. AVIA offers an entry point to artificial intelligence usage in image analysis. So our development team focuses on making the integration of AI tools, so for example, machine learning and deep learning, as easy as possible for you to use. AVIA makes advanced data analysis accessible for all, with no computer science or scripting expertise required, although it is possible to create and apply custom scripts. Using AI helps to simplify the segmentation and with AVIA you can quickly and reliably generate high quality results, helping to speed up your route to publication and un uncover hidden details in your data. Lastly, we wanted to have everything in one platform, from visualising the image, applying AI techniques to exporting results. And what does AVIA stand for? So here in the name, and as you can see also in the logo, it's Artificial Intelligence, Visualization and Image Analysis. So first, let's just start with a few comments about visualization. We have developed our own avia.tiff file format in order to effectively store all kinds of information. So for example, channel settings, segmented objects, rendered meshes, results tables, and also charts, all in the same location. Although it's very important to mention that AVIA can read many file formats. And additionally, AVIA uses open microscopy environment bioformats importer linked from ImageJ Fiji for file types that are not natively supported. For rendering, AVIA uses a pyramidal structure to cope with large data sets in multi-block and resolution rendering. <coughs> Sorry. And the same applies to rendered objects. The system can adjust quality based on the re computer resources available. Now to just touch on image analysis. So in order to have a solution that is suitable for a wide range of applications, we have developed pre-programmed what we call recipes, just like in cooking. For other solutions, you might commonly um, know them as protocols or bio apps, for example. AVIA can do the basics like counting, tracking in 2D and 3D, colocalization, neuron tracing and more. And so some of these recipes have pre-trained machine learning algorithms running in the background. This is those recipes that have the brain symbol next to them. And this can be very useful in bright field images. And as mentioned before, um, there is the opportunity to create your custom scripts because there is Python integration. And what does artificial intelligence stand for? And now let's touch on that in its usage for AVIA. So first, just a little bit of terminology. 
AI, artificial intelligence, refers to software that mimics how our brain learns and thinks. Machine learning is a category of algorithms and its aim is to complete a specific task and learn from training data. Deep learning is a subcategory of machine learning algorithms. It can be more complex. And here the deep learning learn from large amounts of training data and, be, and can even become more accurate than humans. I don't know if anyone's heard about AlphaGo that beat an 18 times world champion um, Go player. So I'm just going to highlight um, how AVIA can use machine learning and deep learning, but in the interest of time and actually getting into AVIA, I will mostly focus in the presentation on the machine learning as aspects. So on the one side, we have machine learning for pixel classification, which is often an initial step in the general image analysis workflow with AVIA, and it quite often replaces any pre-processing that you perform. Machine learning can also be used for object classification. And in AVIA, the pixel classification is GPU accelerated, which allows for an almost instant preview of results. On the other side where we have deep learning, um, as a reminder, it's a subcategory of machine learning algorithms that um, is, requires uh, more training data. And AVIA provides the functionality of deep learning to do image restoration, segmentation and prediction. And again, in the interest of time, I'm just going to more highlight on the machine learning today. So the machine learning pixel classifier in AVIA can help enhance the image. So we have, for example, here on the screen where it can allow the extraction of multiple different structures from a single channel image. The machine learning pixel cl classifier can negate the effects of heterogeneous staining or uneven illumination. It can enhance certain objects of interest and it, it can help to cover a phase or to convert a phase image into a more fluorescent like image for better contrast. The, machine, uh, the use of machine learning and creating an additional confidence map channel can also be used in the segmentation of various samples such as histology, bright field and even challenging fluorescence data. So I'm trying to navigate to my next slide here and it's not working, so sorry if it advances very quickly. Um, how can you use AVIA or how is it delivered? AVIA can be uh, obtained or, or used in, in three different forms. So we have AVIA desktop that can be installed locally on a Windows PC. We have AVIA web, which is an online internet browser based instance of AVIA. It's hosted by Amazon Web Services. And in this case, AVIA can be run on any device with a browser access. And then there is also AVIA Community. So AVIA Community is a, a freeware version and it can be installed locally on a Windows PC. It provides the ability to view results created with a licensed version of AVIA, as well as um, review charts and create new videos. It's perfect for sharing data. So for example, many of the AVIA customers that we have, they might have a, a few copies of AVIA um, licensed version, but then they have the AVIA community version on a lot of computers so that then everybody in the lab or collaborators can then view the results that have been created with the licensed version. And just to touch on some of the packages that we have for AVIA. So AVIA is an annual subscription that has three basic packages. Go, which contains um, quite a lot of the features, then Elevate that can be split into Cell Bio for cell compartmental analysis, or Neuro, which then has recipes for neuron analysis, and then Apex that is then the full suite of tools for AVIA where we can have cell bio and neuro together. Also, um, because we understand that bringing AI, artificial intelligence access for all, um, we also then have the AVIA dev mode to be able to train um, your own deep learning models. And this single add-on can be added onto any of the available packages. 
And so that was a, a very rapid tour of an introduction in terms of presentation um, for Avia. I would like to thank you for your attention of this part of the presentation. I'm going to now just highlight on the Avia website where you can find information about system requirements and also uh, Avia community before getting into using the software. So here we have the Avia website. It's avia-software.com. And under support, we have an option for system requirements. So this was a question before the webinar today. This is why I thought I'd start by highlighting this. And here we have um, some recommendations on system requirements that you need to be able to run Avia on a Windows PC. Under solutions, we have more information about the packages that I mentioned and also about Avia Web. But coming back here to Avia Community, this then explains the aims of Avia Community and the features that it can perform compared to a, a paid version of Avia. And this can be downloaded um, either just from Download Avia Community or under Support Free Downloads. And here on the left, you can download Avia Community. There are also some available demo images that correspond to um, data that's been previously analysed in Avia and then those with the results you'll be able to then at least explore the results with Avia Community version and get an understanding of how then if you create results with Avia version they can be shared with the community version. I also had a question about uh, licenses for Avia. So if any package relating to Go, Elevate or Apex was purchased, so licenses are PC fixed. That means you can use it on one PC. Um, however, if you were to install it on one PC and later decided to um, decided that you wanted to move to another PC to use Avia, that's um, completely possible and it's, it's very, very common. So I'm going to now continue into, um, into the Avia software. Of course, if anybody has any questions, um, I will try to keep an eye on the chat to address them as we go, um, or we can ad address them at the end. So one of the um, other questions that I had was about um, file format that can be accepted in Avia. So I touched on it in the presentation. Under file um, open, we have then here image formats and you'll see that it's quite an extensive list of files that can be then loaded into Avia. But also in the presentation, I mentioned about the ImageJ Fiji open microscopy environment um, bio imports importer. And when you first set up Avia, under the advanced section, you have the option here to add your ImageJ executable, which can then help you launch such data if it's not natively read. In Avia, we have um, a nice help menu. Um, I'm highlighting that particularly, even though you might or not necessarily be um, customers yet, but we have this ability to have a help request. It's actually one of my favorite features. And here um, you can describe problems, make feature requests, general comments and feedback. And here um, you can then submit this um, help submitter and it comes to us directly without the need to try and remember an email address or our support email address. It's all from within the software. Another common question um, for Avia is how do I start to learn the software? So at the moment I've made it a very basic layout. As we go through the session, you'll see it become more complicated. So we have this nice search window at the top. And if I um, just click it, there will be some tiles that appear and we can also then search this window. Okay, today it doesn't want to 
to, for me to search, so that's fine. I can at least open a data set first. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, we have the ability to move the layouts here. And this is a relatively new feature for Avia where um, I've expanded the panels, as you can see, to make the screen a little bit more complex. But I can also reorganize the screen to have a layout that I would like to see. We thought that the ability to have uh, more flexibility in the software um, is much being requested by the Avia general community. And so we wanted to, to bring that to everybody. So there are multiple ways to open images with Avia. We can go to File and Open. We have Open down here in our Image Explorer, but we can also drag and drop files into the software. So here, this is just um, a histology example. I know that the the section um, the session on histology is is not not today, but I will use this as an example to run a 2D pixel classifier. But first, um, you'll notice here on the left, I have lots of um, channels and you might be wondering, well, what are they all for? Well, this is a histology, histology image. And so we have the information split over the red, the green and the blue channel. You'll see here as I've clicked one bar, um, that corresponding channel has been depicted. You also notice I have these little eyes where I can then toggle on or display or hide or toggle off um, the, the channel in this instance. I can also toggle off or on the parent eye. And as we go on to develop objects, you'll also see that um, we can do this in multiple places in Avia. Here where I have this little drop down um, this little arrow, I can expand and collapse the feature. And that is also quite common in multiple places in Avia. So here under the under the red channel, we now have displayed the, the visual um, lookup histogram where we can adjust the sliders by just grabbing the bar. We can also change the numbers of the min and max here and also move the slider bar corresponding to this section and we can adjust manually by entering entering numbers into this box and we can just reset anything that we've done we can change the color by clicking this bar and right clicking on a channel gives further options including to including advanced coloring and the ability to add lookup table mappings so i said that it's a red green blue data set and you're now thinking well what are these four channels below so we have a tissue a nuclei edge and central region of the histology section and these channels are actually confidence maps and they were generated using the avia machine learning pixel classifier which i'm going to go through now to give an example of how we might use the pixel classifier on a 2D data set, doesn't necessarily have to be histology, to be able to, in this instance, identify the nuclei. So I don't know why my search bar is not working, um, but in summary, this is a way that you can ask for, for help with an AVIA, um, and you have the ability to um, go to um, the Avia wiki. So this is where we would learn everything. And I'm highlighting this now because we will be getting into um, how to use the pixel classifier, which is then listed in the wiki. If you can just click it here, it then gives me all of the information about the classifier, um, how you can use it. Um, but also that search bar um, usually also gives me links to um, the YouTube, the Avia Software YouTube channel, where we have um, different playlists um, and directly searching from within Avia, we have the ability to look at um, quick tips. So we have quick tips 
that are one to three minutes. We have tutorials here that are three to five minutes. And we also have online workshops, so pre-recorded workshops that you can then watch at your own leisure. And these workshops are from between one hour to uh, 1.5 hours. And they start with a general presentation before showing you worked examples and having questions during and at the end. So I'm then just going to come back to Avia here. Um, we're going to, again, as I mentioned, depict the nuclei. So we'll hopefully end up with something like this by using the red, green and blue as our input channels. So I'm coming over here to the pixel classifier. Generally, it's not um, happened today, but sometimes if you've been using Avia beforehand, you might have a pixel classifier already listed. And if you open a new data set, it's generally good practice to remove any classifiers that you, you might have started exploring before. Then we have this um, plus button. So this creates a new pixel classifier based on your current image. And you can create pixel classifiers for 2D data sets or 3D data sets. So here it will just automatically generate me a pixel classifier for 2D data. And here I can hover over this classifier and I can rename it that this is then my pixel classifier on my red, green and blue channels. So we have the ability to name things as well. So I don't know if, if um, the people on the call today know much about machine learning pixel classifiers in general. The Avia uh, machine learning pixel classifier uses the random forest algorithm, which is like a decision tree. And based on the drawing that we make on the data set, when the algorithm is applied, the decision tree is applied and it then decides if a pixel should belong to one class or the other class, depending on how you have trained the data. So for example, I'm going to expand here this input and training. Now it's automatically pulled into this area, the red channel. I'm going to add the green and the blue channel because this is a histology section. The information will be split across the red, green and blue channels. So I wanted to add them all. If you have fluorescent data, which I will show you in the, the next example, um, in the 3D example, you can you can um, just um, input the channel of um, inf uh, the, the channel of interest. So, for example, you have uh, three channels, but your protein of interest is on the green channel. You would only hear input that one channel where you also best see the information because you are the one that has to train the classifier by drawing what you want or what you do not want, which we call background, which we're going to do now. So I've added the, the channels here as my input training. I'm going to take this brush. First, I'm going to define some background or a region that we don't want, for example. And you'll see now I have this green circle. I'm going to come closer to the data. I'm going to make my circle just a bit smaller. I'm going to draw some of this white background. I'm going to come to the lighter pink area and draw some of the lighter pink but I'm also going to capture these nuclei. So let me see if I can make it a bit of a better color. So I've, I've taken information that I also actually want to highlight. So now I'm going to take my want channel. I'm going to come in and I'm going to paint here over these nuclei because actually I, I do want to separate these from the actual background. And the reason I've done it this way around is because one pixel can only belong to one class. So if, for example, I just hide this yellow wanted region, you'll see now that we see the data underneath because what was previously the blue has been reassigned to become yellow and is now in our want class. I'm just going to now zoom out a, a little bit. And here at the bottom, we have a magnifying glass. 
this magnifying glass here, when I click it, it will then give me a preview of the results. So also with the little arrow, I can adjust the speed over accuracy. But I'm just going to click it. It's now generating a preview. And here you can then see lots of little yellow areas. And these are the nuclei it has detected based on my little drawing over here. So based on my input, the algorithm has learned that I actually want to highlight the nuclei. Now you'll see down here, it's not depicted these nuclei, and that's because the nuclei that have been stained are not very um, homogenous. So maybe over here, they are more intense. Maybe the shape is slightly different. So I need to just temporarily turn off the preview. Um, let me find an area. I can then say I don't want this, but I do want to have these nuclei. And it's generally good to kind of leave here. They, the nuclei might be touching, but I'll just leave a slight gap. Now I'll come back on to the preview and then you'll see it's better detected the nuclei in this region. You can also use the pixel classifier to um, remove some artifacts like these. And whilst it's not, um, I'm not going to do it today, but if you have multiple images open at the bottom, you can train on a couple of multiple images. So if you had different artifacts, you could jump to the next image, make a, a slight drawing uh, and then preview the, the same classifier. You can also save the classifier so that you can apply it to other data sets at a later time. And for publications, it's recommended to copy all of the training fields and training data to one location because sometimes the reviewer does request to see um, the drawings that you made to teach the algorithm. Down at the bottom here, we have a little little square for ROI processing. And if I just click that to expand, I can show an eye. It's now lo located in the central region and then a little box here. So if I check this box, it will only apply to the region of the ROI. That's then denoted by a square within a square at the bottom. And you can see now that my preview is only on this small defined region and not the entire data set. If I carry on now and teach the, the machine learning pixel classifier and apply, it will only apply with um, providing me results for this region because I have ROI processing selected. So for now, I'm just going to turn that off and come back again to well, what is output? So I, I'll also hide my region of interest. So what is output? At the moment, what we see and what is on the left are confidence maps. So we have the ability to output the result as a confidence map. What is a confidence map? A confidence map is on a scale of zero to one, with one being the most confident that the pixel should belong to that specific class. However, obviously zero to one, we cannot visualize that. So to be able to visualize that, we turn zero to one to zero to 255. And so these maps on the left are confidence maps on a scale of zero to 255. If I were to uh, just teach this now, um, it's been applied, or it's, it's been taught rather, sorry. And we know that this want channel will output. We have the circle and the don't want will not output. Obviously, you can have multiple classes. Maybe you wanted to identify the different types of nuclei shapes here. You might want another nuclei class. But just in the interest of giving you an overview, I'll stick to the want and don't want. And here it's it will not output. I'm just going to apply then to get our want region over here. And we can see that maybe some of the nuclei are a little bit close together. So or they're not very well defined. So I'm coming back to the main image. I'm going to come back to the pixel classifier. I'm just going to preview and I'm going to then find an area where I've got, for example, here a, a very close 
closely touching uh, nuclei and I'm going to draw the don't want and then the want with a, a very hopefully small area in between maybe I've done a, a bad job here today but I'll then click preview I've probably uh, been too generous there but now you'll notice that I have the teach and apply button back. So even when we have output the confidence map, we can make more drawings on our data set. So because I do not like the drawings that I did there, I'm just going to undo them with control Z. Maybe this might be a bit of a, a better example. I'm just going to draw those as don't want and draw some of our nuclei here. And then just preview that it's a little bit better. So you can see it's a, a reiterative process in the beginning. And then I'm just going to teach. To teach again these extra drawings that I have made. And this time when I apply, it will overwrite this channel that I created before. There is the option for it to create a brand new channel. That, that's completely fine if, if you wanted to do that. So I'm just going to just apply. So that's outputting as a confidence map. We also have the ability to output as masked channel segmentation and smart segmentation. So smart segmentation applies degree of detection, partition and, and size adjustment. So there are not sliders that you can truly accurately um, slide, <laughs> change I, I propose. Um, this is why quite often we have people do a pixel classifier to obtain the confidence map and then use the confidence map as input for a recipe to then have a, a better definition and segmentation of the area and objects that they are interested in detecting. But I'm just going to show you the, the smart, segment so, sorry, smart segmentation output today just as an idea of what it would look like. So whichever one you have selected over here, so the smart segmentation, there's also segmentation where you can remove small objects. You can still, if you have this selected, um, you can generate the preview and you'll see now I have lots of little different colours on the screen. That's then how the segmentation would output. I'm going to just output the segmentation and I'm going to click apply. And so now these stations appear under object set display settings. And I have the eye again that I mentioned before where I can turn them off or, or turn them on. And so these are the ones that I've created before. And then whenever you have objects in Avia, you then have the corresponding measurements in the spreadsheet area. So you can have default measurements here, but then by clicking this little ruler, you have further measurements that you can select or unselect relating to morphology, intensity, position and count. And anything that you have then in the spreadsheet can also be uh, viewed in this chart area. And it's quite interactive. So if I select points in the chart, they highlight in the spreadsheet and also are identifiable on the data set. So if I just see if I can do that, you'll see highlighted. Um, I've picked the larger area and perimeters, so I can just kind of sort those like that and go to the top and you can then see um, that they've been highlighted and they are highlighted um, outlined in green in the data set. So it's, it's quite interactive. And this is the advantage of having um, the avia.tiff format because we have, have all of this information in one place. Um, I also had a question about the ability to, um, I read it as the ability to then take the data into other softwares. Um, that is possible. So if you do not save it as avia.tiff, you can in the options area save it as um, I think it's more like an uncompressed format which I'm told acts more like a just a TIFF in general however you have to understand that then you will not have your data with the objects with the measurements and the charts in one location and then also you could not um, view any results that you created in Avia community.
Okay, so um, I've covered in some now the general pixel in 2D. Now I'm going to provide a 3D example. Um, drag and drop again my um, data set into Avia. So here this was, I believe, a fluorescent image that here I actually only have the one channel. You can see that it's now a 3D data set. We have the slider here where I can then slide to look at other Z slices. And up on the top left, I have the ability to switch to 3D view. So I switch to 3D view. And now with um, left click on the mouse, I can make rotations and right click, I can just kind of grab and pan the screen. And what we are going to um, do now is the pixel classifier, but for 3D to obtain something that looks like this. And then I will get on to um, using the recipes, just running through the recipe console as an example and how you may want to apply a recipe. And I'll show you some outputs of some other recipes um, as well, because once we run through a recipe, you'll kind of get the understanding of how one applies the recipe. Where you will see what I mentioned before. Um, I have this pixel classifier up here. Um, hello, everybody. Sorry about that. I was disconnected from the call. I hope you can hear me okay now. So I've, I switched to um, the 3D data set. I show that it's 3D because of the slider. I'm not sure how much you might have missed there. And now I just mentioned how um, we've, I, I clicked the plus, it generates a 3D pixel classifier. And I'm going to now run through very similar principles to before, um, but I'll also be using the RI processing more because it's a 3D data set. So here in the input, I have the original channel that I have. Um, I want to find a, an area where I have some nice um, nuclei that I want to depict. So probably around about this area. Um, I can show, I can draw some background and same as before, I can make some, some want channel. So I'm just going to um, come over to these nuclei here. I need to give you a better color again. Um, and draw some background and similar to before I went to draw the nuclei maybe I should have a bit of a bigger brush and this time we can use the control button and go up or down a slice to provide some more information across the, the stack so just give some background and then the want area like this and I'm going to again turn on this region of interest it just happens to be here but it can be moved and the ROI processing again and I'm just going to click the preview and it will only preview in this area but I can make drawings from anywhere in the data set and also You'll see it on this area on this slice, but I can move to a different slice and it will then show me a preview there. So the preview applies to the entire um, stack. And now if I turn off the um, the preview and also turn off the region of interest processing. If I now um, click again the preview, it will show me on the entire data set like that. And then you can see if I move to a Z slice, um, I can say, oh, these ones it needs a bit more information here, perhaps. And again, this um, reiterative process of just, you know, making some some drawings to give it a bit more training information on the different um, sh shapes, structures, curvature that you're interested in. Because the um, benefit of the machine learning pixel classifier is that 
it goes beyond basic thresholding. The pixel classifier learns based on the edge of what you define, the curvature, the, the texture, the shape, and then uh, these can be um, applied to the data or explored if you wanted to. We have here the um, advanced teaching features where these are for the default really that I'm using, but then for 3D data, we also have um, some 3D ones that can be applied. So if I just click here, Sobol 3D, for example, I'm not sure if we'll see it, but they the pixel um, the pixels slightly changed on the on the on the preview here. So if I just uncheck that, just look, you see how they just slightly change, and this is then these teaching features. And so if we come back to um, the pixel classifier that I had before um, in the wiki, we then have how the, the the features are explained here on on what's defined and how you might do that um, with the different um, advanced options that are available. And similar to before, we can output as a confidence map and we can also output to segmentation. So I'm just rapidly going to teach this and apply to get um, a new channel here. So that's the one you can see that I probably need to give it a bit more uh, training. And there's one that I generated before. And so um, now when you uh, apply a recipe, um, I could use this want channel if I wanted to. Um, to, do, to, to do the recipe apply, um, we then have recipe console. So what I'll do is I'll just start by using the default settings um, or, or those in the tutorial. So maybe now as we're moving on to the recipes actually, um, if I come back to the wiki, hope this isn't too jumping around. Um, we have on the left a list of recipes and for the recipes we have, so this is the one I'm going to show, we have explanations about the parameters and presets but also you'll notice here we have a tutorial. So if I click and go to the tutorial area, we have the written steps of the tutorial and what the output would look like. And we also have a, a, a for this recipe a miniature video. And then these are just explaining the default measurements, but I've already showed you how you can add further measurements. So we are literally going to follow um, this uh, recipe tutorial today, just to kind of show how it is to begin learning Avia, um, which is why we have this wiki and, and the Avia YouTube to, to help you in your self learning before then applying to, to your own data sets. So on the, on the, in the recipe console here, we have a list of recipes. Um, we have a list that contains recipes predominantly for 3D data and, a, and then recipes without 3D are more aimed at 2D data sets. So for this particular data set, we are going to use 3D object analysis meshes. This generates us a mesh structure around our object of interest. Whereas the spots equivalent just gives us a, a spot that's the, I think it's the, the center um, the center point of the of the um, what would be the object if you only want to do a simple count, for example. But most of the time uh, I use the 3D object analysis meshes example. You always like the pixel classifier have to remember to expand input and output. And so just to show you this data set, I'm going to first do the recipe on the original original channel. You can also again use the region of interest. So in this area, it's in a slightly different location. For the pixel classifier, it was down the bottom. For the recipe, you can see it here and you would check this box for ROI processing to have the square within a square at the bottom to denote that ROI processing is activated. And then we have um, sections that you, in, in all of the recipe consoles, you would make the top down approach where you expand and look at these um, parameters and then expand the next area. And similar to um, 
the pixel classifier, we have these magnifying preview or the magnifying glass that displays a preview. And we also have these little arrows where you can click them and substitute in or out other information or other options rather. So again, I'm just going to follow um, the tutorial and the tutorial states that I have the smoothing at nine. Um, here I'm going to have the remove background option available because I'm using the original data set. Whenever you use the pixel classifier want channel, you would then choose that in this input section, but you would skip remove background because in theory, you have removed the background by identifying the pixels that you only want. And so um, now I'm going to do our average object radius as five. Um, minimum edge intensity, the tutorial explained that it's five. And then the fill hole size of being two. And if I just do this ROI processing here, go to a, an area, I can then do a preview of the detection. And you can see down the bottom, it's generating a preview. And then this is what has been detected. I can now turn that off. And then for the partitioning, we have two to six with a mesh moving factor of two. And then here, this is what applies the level of um, separation. So you can apply or skip the, the separation or what we define as partitioning. And again, we can preview um, this here and you can see then a split there. Maybe it's slightly over split. Um, and then should we run this, we can run it either on the region of interest or on the whole data set. Um, I'm just run it, going to run it on the whole data set, uh, sorry, on the ROI region for now, just as a demonstration. So it's calculating measurements. So these are the default measurements. You do have the option to um, uncheck this icon here to deselect and explain to yourself whether you do not want the default measurements to be applied. So sometimes I uncheck this and then later add my measurements uh, manually by going to the spreadsheet area and this little uh, measurement window. So because I perform this on the ROI, we only have a small selection of um, objects appear there and you can see them then in that area. If I was to run it on the whole data set with the same parameters, you would have then something that looks like this. And similar to then what I showed you before, you have measurements um, from the objects or of the objects in the spreadsheet area. And these are then also visible in the chart area. And what's quite nice then for when we get to something like this is I can select these icons. I can come to the layout to look at, or maybe it's my 3D display option is already visible. And I can click this icon and now I have different options where I can show only my selected meshes. And then these were the meshes that I had selected in my chart and then they are then visible here. And so you're probably thinking that's OK to run through um, these parameters with uh, following the tutorial numbers to input. Granted, yes. So with Avia, we also have this auto button for Avia that learns that can pick the best parameters. So sometimes you can click that and it will give you some parameters as a starting guide and then you can make minor adjustments after that. And also you can, let me just turn these objects off for the moment. You can use um, the annotations tool. So I have annotations up there. I like to have my annotations tool at the bottom here. So with the annotations tool, you have the ability to draw lines and 
ROI regions where you can then measure your objects of interest. So your, you have my lengths here that I would be interested in. And also then I'm normally very bad at drawing these areas, not a good, got a good hand. Um, here we then have some areas. So these, these tools can then help you input the appropriate numbers in your recipe console should you should you need to do that and then um, you have to remember if you input the want channel that you skip to remove background step but then that any um, minimum edge intensity here because it's a want channel it's from zero to two five five with two five five being the most confident that um your pixel belongs to that class so you have to remember that when you're then applying the recipe on a on a confidence map whereas this particular data set is a 16 bit i think so that would come might come into effect as well um and so coming back again to this line pro this line and drawing tool at the bottom you'll see here that i have um profiles that then can give me kind of like an intensity profile as well of of the pixels um some of the recipes so we, it's not in the 3d recipes but for example some of the the 2d recipes like if i just jump to this cell count you have these question marks as well so these question marks can then help guide you on how to adjust the slider depending on what you would like to achieve and then i thought that it might be nice to show you a couple of other um outputs perhaps so we have uh, i have a cell count one here where this is a relatively noisy data set where are my objects i turn them off so you can see the cells um what's quite nice for the recipes as well is that um so i turn my the, the objects off of the cells just so you could actually see the cells below but with avia if you've processed um your image and you have your objects like this, but you've not saved your recipe settings, which it is possible to do here. You can save the recipe settings to apply at a later date. You can open um, a data set with your objects and you'll think, okay, how did I generate those? I can't remember, I, I didn't write my numbers down in my, in my lab book, I didn't save the settings. There is this little option here to use the recipe settings that created this result. So I clicked it, it's taking me now to the recipe console and it has adjust, auto adjusted the sliders. And these were the numbers that I input to obtain these results. So just to demonstrate that I can create a new object group and just click start. And then if I go to my um, objects display, if I turn off the original, the same are under underneath. So that's another one of my uh, favorite features. And we also have the ability to um, adjust the color. So whether they're all the same color, um, they're colored by um, name, or in this case, that it would be the object number, and even color by measurements if you wanted to. So those measurements that are selected here, um, I can just change that and adjust the slider or even remove the colors if I wanted to. So um, here we I've input the, the GFP. Let me turn those off, sorry. Um, you can also use the, I clearly did a, a bad pixel classifier here, but um, you can also use the want channel just like before. Um, with the other recipe, you have the option to select the want um, where you would skip the remove background step. So let me try to at least remember my numbers. We always change back. And you would just then come back to your annotations tool, 
find your your lines and your areas to then go through these um, the the options that we have available. And so there's an example of um, just using the, the want as the input. And again, you can just uh, adjust the parameters accordingly. So there, there is some oversplitting. Um, and sometimes when you use the pixel classifier as the original input, it, if you have situations like this, it could be that you need to um, better refine your, your pixel classifier um, to make it cleaner, ready for, for the recipe console. And you can also just keep adjusting the settings until you get something that looks um, relatively OK. And you can also try without um, the pixel classifier like we have done for the other examples. We also have the ability, I won't go into it in the interest of time because I wanted to just demonstrate one more um, results output um, data set, but in the um, object set display settings, you can also right click to create a workflow once you've gone through certain things. So if you've started with a pixel classifier, then you used your pixel classifier input to generate um, your objects from your recipe. You can create a workflow by this method. You can also go to analysis and workflow processor where in the editor you would explain um, you create a new workflow, you make a description, um, format, just double check your images if you wanted to batch apply and analysis. So here you would say, I'm going to do a pre-processing of the pixel classifier. You select whichever pixel classifier you have used or that you've got loaded if you've saved it before. Um, which input selections you want to run it on. And then you come to the recipe and then you, you kind of go through this like a, a workflow in, in a batch way. Um, and then when you get to the run section, you add your files, the folder of files and where you want the output to be. They will queue and you can kind of see it processing at the bottom if you were to do it um, in real time. And then you have a history and you can just click one of them and it will show you a little preview. And then you can also open the file location and load, load it into the software to then review results. But batch apply is also possible with Avia. So I understand that we are getting uh, close to time perhaps now, um, but I just wanted to show just, a, just particle tracking um, where we have um, particle track recipe, particle tracking. And if I just show that here, um, I can also show you the results that were already made with the, this recipe. Um, I just turn those off and if I just look then at the detection, you can see that uh, based on this uh, image, we have the detection of these areas. So now we have a time lapse and we know that it's time lapse because where was previously the Z, we have a T. Let me just make it a bit more visible. Um, and so we see the preview on here, the first frame, but I can move to another frame and then we see the preview of the detected bright particles. I just turn that off. So then you can see these particles moving, moving through this um, data set here. Um, and you just go through the options. Again, clicking the question mark if, if needed, and we can start that to obtain objects that are then um, first just the object. We also have an anchor and we can look at the track. So I can increase the track length where we have the views like this. And even we can add a trend. So maybe my arrows are a little bit too thick. So I can reduce those perhaps. And that's then an example of using um, a fluorescent perhaps of um, particles that you want to track over time and then inf corresponding information in the spreadsheet and then in the chart area 
and we have um, the trace plot when we select them all. It's not visible. Here we go. So I've selected individual ones. I can also select them all there and have a trace plot. And then we can also have a directional plot like that. Um, I can click, click one individually. So this one is this one that's been highlighted. And again, I will not get into it today, but just show you that then you you also have the ability to to do some uh, track editing. So I like to have my track editor down at the bottom. Then here you have a track editor where if you want to, you can um, merge and split the objects and tracks etc. It might be good for maybe nuclei tracking, which is also possible. So this is a 2D track, but 3D tracking is also possible. Um, I might have an example of a data set that I can just drop in. Um, 3D object track. So here we this is then the Z. And the time. If I just switch to 3D view. And then go through the time we can hopefully you can see the, the little objects moving. And I can make some track. And trends so if I turn off the objects, you can then see the track and the trend over time. So hopefully I've, I've not gone uh, too fast today. Um, how, how are we doing for time? Do, do we have any questions? Is there anything that was unclear? Anything that I covered too fast? So in Richard, there are no questions. So if you have uh, any question, just unmute your microphone and ask. Okay, uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you want, we can split uh, the webinar now and uh, who wants to see more, uh, we can we can continue uh, a little bit later. Uh, for the others, uh, thank you for your attention. And just a remind, in next Tuesday, we organize the second part of the webinar. And uh, in this time, it was really dedicated for analysis of transmitted light samples and uh, thank you very much and bye and uh, we now wait maybe some few seconds and who will stay here uh, we can uh, shortly continue with the next samples and who wants you can you can disconnect and we can see uh, next time thank you very much thank you Okay, Lindsay, uh, I think you can you can continue and mm -hmm. thank you for your uh, for your uh, uh, interest about uh, these applications. You're welcome. <laughs> so I, you'll see now I have this search bar working at the top. I'm not sure what happened before. I know I experienced experienced midway an, an Internet glitch. Maybe this was why. Um, but just to come back here. Um, in this search bar is 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 very useful in Avia because we have some of the, the tiles here. Um, and again, this is expand option. Um, and as I was demonstrating, we, we have the ability to then to then search for keywords so you can use it to then help you learn Avia. So we got the wiki that I opened manually before, but if I click this, it automatically opens. Um, and then again, those videos that I were explain was explaining before. So the quick tips, the tutorials, the online workshops. And also we have these Avia commands. So I have seen this used quite a lot for people beginning to learn Avia, where you can navigate to certain areas and it highlights yellow. Um, or especially if you've opened Avia after somebody else and you're not sure where they like to have their tabs. Um, it's useful to be located to that area. Um, 
coming back to somebody else using Avia, we have this ability to save um, pre presets. So if, if I make it in a certain view, I can save that and then relaunch it at a, at a later time. And uh, other commands include everything. So if I just list the word everything, um, then all of those options are listed. So I can open again some some other data sets and we can look at them. Um, I have a neuron analysis data set that um, is quite a nice example of the avia that learns that I mentioned before. So this um, is you can see how, how noisy this is. Let me just clear my pixel classifiers. Um, we have quite a, a noisy data set. It is a, a Z stack, so I can switch then to, to 3D view. I've showed you the results before I got there, but never mind. It's quite quite a nice data set to show that on. So it's not very thick, but it's quite noisy. So here I applied then a pixel classifier to better clear up some of the noise. And then um, this is an example of what the, the segmentation that, that I did based on, so this is, I used the pixel classifier input and I went through the parameter settings in the recipe. So these are the ones that, that I, um, if I open the recipe, I manually adjusted all of these parameters by using the annotations tool in, in 2D to work out um, the branch, dendrite diameters, soma diameters, etc. Um, and this was the output that I obtained with the same um, data set, but this time using Avia that learns, I got then just the, the soma really, um, but that was with the original input channel. So with this channel, this was what could be detected with Avia that learns. But then by using the machine learning pixel classifier and then Avia that learns, I obtained uh, structures that look like that. So they are relatively similar to the ones that I obtained. Some slight, slight differences, but for an algorithm, I didn't think that that was bad. In fact, in some places, they pick up a little bit more than what, what I was able to. So I could, uh, we could go through that now on how we would use this as kind of like a workflow. So I'm going to remove all classifiers, then I'm going to click plus to make a 3D one. I'm going to come to this area and draw some background. And wanted region. So you can also use the lasso. Now here I'm drawing um, just the want, but it's most often good practice to do um, background and want so that then you have a good understanding or the algorithm un understands the environment between the want and the background. If I can just do that here, for example, whoops. And so uh, with, with a pixel classifier, it does depend on your input as to what you get as the output, which is common for a, a lot of situations. So I have the preview here. I can see how that looks, so it's a bit noisy. So I could do with um, telling it where I have background. So this is background. This is just noise.
can be sometimes you you might do a pixel classifier and think oh i'm just going to start again and then we will teach this and apply i already checked that it will output to a, a new channel so that's what i had before this is my one from today it's applied to the entire z maybe there are areas that i could clean it up better and then i can go to the recipe console three neuron analysis for fluorescent microscopy i would want to include my want channel we want a new object group and i'm just going to select auto for it to estimate the parameters so here you can see it's manually adjusted the parameters and I don't know, I haven't I didn't use this data set in a while, but let's see what it will output for us without us manually adjusting these sliders. I should have un I should have unchecked the measurement box to make it quicker, but actually it wasn't so bad. Um and then switch to 3D view. And so just based on I started with with drawing the pixel classifier, you can see that these are the results that I have just generated just now in front of you in some moments. And that was by using the want channel with avia.learns and I did not adjust a parameter. So we got the original data set. If I just turn that off, you see the original data set. And that was the one that I generated previously with a different pixel classifier, see they're relatively similar. And they are much better than my manual input. Well, not much better, but it, it's much quicker than me manually calculating all of the parameters. So as I mentioned, this avia that learns is always a good starting place before then um, adjusting the, the parameters further. And so since I have um, used the pixel classifier to then go through to a recipe, as I mentioned before, I could create a workflow. Um, this is then where you can then again run through um, the options. So it knew that I did a pixel classifier. Um, no, no, that was the previous one. I just delete both of those and we'll open it again to see what it pulled in. So here it knows that I did a pixel classifier on the first channel. And then it knows that I performed the recipe on then the third channel. Because I already had this one, which was effectively the second. And at this point, if you have then um, modified and you do not do it directly from the area here, so I right clicked and I said make a workflow, it pulled in the, these, these recipe settings. But if you wanted to look at a different one, you can also use these icons to use different set the settings from the recipe console. Um, and here just to, to view the settings in the recipe console as well. I'm always quite impressed with, with this data set. Obviously, it depends on the data that you have. And I always wonder about this area here. Should that be a detected SOMA? Um, and that could just then be that I need to modify that in the pixel classifier area to say that it's probably not detected. Oh, I did detect very well, but maybe the threshold was too low. Um, the confidence wasn't very, very high for this. Or maybe that it, within there, there are some slight, slight gaps or because it's one of the smaller SOMA, it probably wasn't within the 
detection of, of the recipe settings. Just trying to think of what else we have for that we could look at. Um, some because I I don't want to show too much because I know that um, Matthias will cover more with everybody in the next session. We have three D EM analysis that can give rise to um, segmentation like this. So this particular um, data set was processed using one of the um, deep learning models available on the website. So during my presentation, I didn't get into deep learning too much because I wanted to at least make sure I showed you the, the foundations of AVIA. But on the AVIA website, we have um, under support, um, we have the model library. Now with AVIA, um, you can apply deep learning models. I've never seen these these images before. This is why I'm <laughs> quite hesitant here. Um, they are new to me. I'm not quite sure what's happening there with the site, but um, normally anyway, there is lots of model libraries. Here we go. Um, so we have a, a model library and whether you have AVIA Go, AVIA Elevate, um, or the Apex um, versions, you can apply these pre-trained deep learning models to data sets. So um, the particular data set that I showed you, I think used um, one of these EMs to, to make the segmentation. And that is as simple as just opening the deep learning model into AVIA and just kind of not really adjusting many parameters and, and going ahead. Um, so you can, as, as well as downloading the models from online within AVIA, you can also download um, models from the updater window. You have a models installer, so you can install the models. And then I'll have to find my models. Um, they are generally in the this PC. C drive, um, program files, like a microsystems. Then you have deep learning and models where you have the models listed here. And I'm not sure which one was used for this particular data set, but just as an example, I'm going to drag it and drop it in the recipe console area. And then you have your deep learning model there where you can choose your input channel and then um, obtain the result. So I don't know if it's the, the good model for the, this data set, but we can at least just see what happens. If it goes wrong, it doesn't matter. Um, and at least then this this is uh, an example of how you would apply some of these, these deep learning models that are available on the website by either downloading or in installing the model the model installer and dragging and dropping into into this area. So it looked like it processed. You go to the objects. I don't know if it's got confused with what I was doing. Oh, here we have we have our result over here on, on the left. And so that's then an example of um, running a model to get um, some 8-bit eight, um, mask. Um, 
another common question is um, just talking about mask. It reminded me that um, sometimes people do ask once you've made a segmentation, can you um, export as um, export the segmentation as, as mask, whether that's binary mask or labeled mask into other softwares? And yes, you can. Um, here on the right, so I know I have this nuance set open, but you can export to um, a labeled mask here. And if I just open up one of the other data sets, so maybe this one, you can then have the um, meshes and cross sections and you have the ability to export objects to a binary mask labeled mask or copy objects to a binary channel, for example. So that's coming back to the question about the cross, compa cross compatibility between other softwares. If you want to do further processing on your binary and labeled masks, then yes, it is possible. Are there any, um, you're all very quiet. Are there any, any questions at all or any in particular that somebody would like to see that I could maybe um, address? Okay. Uh... If there are no questions, I think uh, we can finish. It was it was uh, really impressive. Thank you very much, Wednesday. And uh, of course, if you will have uh, any questions or comments in future, don't hesitate to contact me anytime. And or if you will have any uh, hard questions for me, I will listen to the Lindsay and uh, we answer to you, uh, of course, and thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you that you're joining our webinar and uh, we will see uh, next week on histological webinar. Thank you uh, so much, Lindsay. And now it's just to say uh, bye to all and thank you. Yes, thank you very much for, for having me. I hope it's been uh, an insightful um, time today. Um, with Avia, we have these example data sets. I hope people get the opportunity to try your own data sets with Avia community. Uh, and if you need to try Avia and running the recipes on your own data sets, that is also possible. <laughs>